Um, how many of you uh, have, uh, I think all of you are uh, practicing Agile, is that fair assumption? How many of you like Agile? How many of you are enthusiastic? How many of you are greatly happy about Agile? Okay. How many of you are unhappy about Agile? I think you, you have more problems because of Agile, you were better off than it was non Agile. Okay, none. Okay, interesting. Uh, so I'm going to share my experiences with uh, what what all things have worked and what all things haven't worked uh, when I actually practice Agile in my projects, uh, the environments that I have worked with. I've been working in Agile environments since uh, 2006 and I've seen a lot of interesting scenarios where we try to practice Agile, few things work, few things did not work. And I, I actually believe that there is something called as theoretical Agile and there is uh, something called as practical Agile. Now, theoretical Agile talks about uh, you have a lot of things, you have a lot of nice things uh, put up there. They are available on different forums, different uh, uh, webinars, sessions, and all of that. Uh, you will see a lot of people are coming with different frameworks, different tools, uh, different products, and they are saying that you have to follow uh, this particular methodology, you follow uh, this particular, uh, particular tool, and life is going to be amazing. Unfortunately, that has not been the case uh, with me or the projects that I have worked on. So I thought I'll uh, share my experiences with all of you. So uh, our Agile journey actually started with a lot of these explorations, a lot of these thoughts. So I was working with a product development company and our uh, vice president of engineering uh, was from US. So he went to US, uh, one of the business conferences and he came back and said, guys, we're going Agile. You know, he, he heard this word Agile uh, from that you know, conference. And somehow we got an impression that this is an amazing thing. You know, this is the thing that we were looking for. You know, uh, and it's going to be faster, better, cheaper. You follow Agile and we're going to have very quick deliveries and we deliver within two months, we deliver within one month. Customer is going to be happy. We're going to get money very quickly and that's going to be amazing. You know, life is going to be amazing. That is how it started. Uh, and uh, it, this, that was a product development scenario. For service-based scenario, this is what we had. You know, our sales guys, marketing guys, or uh, business development guys said, guys, you know, we need to have Agile as a keyword in our arsenal. You know, uh, all other guys are following Agile, all, all other guys are saying that our delivery mechanism is Agile. We also must say that. You know, we cannot say that, oh, you know, we are waterfall guys. Have you seen that? Have you heard or have you observed that? Where everyone wants to make sure they are not in their companies, branding, marketing, everywhere. Uh, it's mentioned that we are Agile. No one wants to say that we are not there. This is how it started uh, and it, we actually had exactly opposite reactions as well. And uh, these were completely anti-Agile. People said, oh, I don't think Agile is going to work for us. You know, we have a different environment, our needs are different, our, our uh, scenarios are different and I don't think it will work for us. Some of the guys said, you know, we work in uh, banking environment. So I'm currently uh, coaching a project which is for a, uh, investment banking. And the bank said, we have compliances, we have rules, you know, we have uh, certain compliance things that have to be met. And we cannot just uh, put anything and dump it on our production and customers are getting new features every now and then. And without we having thoroughly tested that, you know, without the UIT cycle, the certification cycle being complete, we cannot have anything going up. You know, so it's not going to work for us. Uh, we also had a lot of customers who work in storage, networking, virtualization, cloud space. They said, come on, you know, you cannot deliver hardware in pieces. So one of our customers actually uh, delivers storage arrays. So they have huge storage arrays, boxes like this, which are actually shipped as, the, as their product. They said, we cannot give you the framework, I mean, just the, just the, uh, the pieces of this hardware coming in nutshells. And, you know, you cannot imagine uh, different motherboard and then, then different devices of uh, your CPU coming and then on one point you will have CPU built ready. They said, no, it doesn't work in our environment. You know, it, that's not for us. Uh, then some of the uh, projects were completely production support. It was maintenance contract, maintenance project. They said, what? I mean, how would you plan a sprint, you know? I would say, okay, in this particular sprint of two weeks, I'm going to have these 20 defects fixed. And suddenly tomorrow morning I come and I open my sales force and suddenly a new ticket has come up. I open my service now, I open my remedy and something else is burning now. So I don't care about my sprint plan, I'll have to get on to the most priority tickets. So I don't think your sprint and all those things make sense to us. We also had a lot of scenarios where people said it's a compliance driven environment. You know, 
no so agile is not for us not not a thing we can think of and we also had some responses where people said come on we have been doing incremental deliveries anyway you know so what's so different i'm sure many many uh, of you would be doing phase driven development right uh, there gone are the days where you would have two year cycle three year cycle kind of thing many people actually anyway started doing three months uh, cycles four month cycle okay so what's different in agile we've been doing incremental deliveries anyway so those were all the scenarios uh, that we started with and uh, then actually i'd like to share some of the scenarios of different projects of course i cannot name the project name or the client name but i'd like to share the scenarios and what worked and what didn't work in different projects so this particular project was a product development company uh, and we used version 1 uh and this was one of the funny experience i mean we started this was way back in 2006 uh what happened is we had flood of agile tools we said we want to follow agile but which tool to use you know we have version 1 rally jira and what not we have lot of different tools which one to use somehow someone said okay we're going to use uh, version 1 we started with version 1 everyone started dumping the product backlog and it collapsed because this was uh, the tool was also coming up it wasn't ready for this huge backlog And then we again had a problem. Oh, you know, did we make a right decision? Uh, and we have we made a huge investment. Now we cannot go to another product. So we had a challenge in tools front. Uh, we had al- another interesting problem. We had multiple parallel releases going on and multiple product lines. So this organization, product development organization, we had three different product lines. <coughs> One of the product line decided to go agile. You know, we said okay for this whole product line, we'll be having agile cycles and all that. But the other two product lines were on waterfall. They didn't decided to change. They had their business reasons and all that. But of course, as you can imagine, uh, the product line A had dependencies on the other two product lines, and that was a a lot of chaos there. You know, because we would we would say that hey, you know, in our sprint one, uh, we need some components which are being built by your team, and they said, oh, I don't know what your sprint one means, but I'm developing it in July. So then then our entire sprint planning uh, is gone for toss. Doesn't work. Uh, so that that's what we had, you know, just one uh, product line following the child, other ten, and we had cross team dependencies, which is lot of uh, delays. We actually had lot of uh, debate. Should we build an automation product uh, of our own? Should we invest in homegrown automation framework, or should we buy one? Have any one of you seen that dilemma? Where you know, uh, let's say you want to choose Selenium. There are a lot of companies. There are a lot of uh, products out there which are actually Selenium-based framework, which is already available. You can actually uh, get that. You can even get uh, scriptless automation framework. You know where people have built a UI. So on your UI, you can do your whole automation, and you really don't have to care whether it is uh, using Selenium or WebDriver or RC or whatever in the background. You don't really need to know that. So then, should we purchase those uh, automated frameworks or should we build on your own? That was a big debate. Uh, we decided to go our own way, and as you can see, you know there would be a lot of pros and cons and debate happening. Uh, and people would say, "Oh, you know, our product is different, our UI is different, our needs are different, our backend integration is different. These commercial tools may not solve that problem." Uh, but that's another problem. And if you are uh, getting into such environments, I'm sure you will also face uh, some of these scenarios. should we actually build our own uh, framework because agile goes a lot with automation as well right so you will hit this scenario whether should we invest on our own or should we use the products that are out uh, in the market we also had uh, detached operations teams and uh, engineering team so we had a big engineering organization we were actually build our whole product in 3 months and then it would actually sit there uh, for two more months for our op- ops team to deploy it in production because operations team said oh you know we have our own production deployment timelines and the the next production deployment is happening in october so we don't care when your sprint finishes when your release planning finishes or whatever we have our cycles defined so that was again a, a funny scenario and even though we had a lot of things completed it couldn't go out on production so you are not really getting value out of that uh, Uh, also another problem i have seen which is not just unique to this project is agile was implemented as per the project managers interpretations have you seen that like uh, if you have 10 different teams and 10 different scrum masters or 10 different project managers then basically the way i would uh, run my agile environment would be completely different than the way he would do it you know because the way i interpret and there are a lot of subjectivity to this whole scenario 
So the way I would do it could be completely different than the way someone else would do it. So that was another uh, challenge we had. Uh, we also had another big debate, you know, who handles uh, production tickets? Because our same team uh, was actually working on new feature development as well as production support. So, uh, because we had a previous version of the product already in uh, production, so there are customers out there, there might be defects coming in, there might be enhancement requests coming in, as well as we have new release development going on. So who would do that? And we had two different approaches. We had one approach where actually uh, it's the same team, so the same team is working on scrum work as well as production backlog. And uh, yeah. So one thing, see, if you go back to the previous slide, all these problems that you've listed seems to be there because someone is from the uh, bottom, someone who is just like a developer or someone who is, who, who is thinking it is eject. If you do it like this, all these problems will happen. The problem, the decision has to be taken at the CEO level. The CEO is to des decide that we want to go, go eject. If Correct. You, so in your case, was it, what was the case? So interestingly, it was actually top down, where the organization said we want to go agile. Um, yeah. Everyone should follow agile. But then, uh, whether it is uh, team driven or whether it is, uh, uh, you know, whether it is bottom up or top down, you will see some of the scenarios like this implementation as per project managers. I've seen this as happening in multiple different environments, uh, and that could be because your organization doesn't does not have uh, right standards and methodologies in place. Uh, so the coach, was, coach was not there, or what? No, we, we didn't have design coach, and that was one of the things. Yeah, how will it? Work? Well, well, that's an interesting thing. I'll come to that as well because in some cases, some organizations would have an agile coach, and that's a debate whether. You should have an internal agile coach or external agile coach because that again is an investment. And some projects, some organizations would go for it, some may or may not. So that's another uh, problem we have. So if CEO decided to uh, that they have all the organizations should be uh, agile, how come you have got the one product line on agile and other product line not on agile? How come you have ops team which doesn't know about agile? Yeah, so see the scenario was basically, that's why I said that if the, when I said that if the engineering VP said we are going agile, we had different product lines and one of the VP of one of the product lines actually decided to go agile. So it's not that the whole organization with all the three product lines are actually going uh, out. And it is at much lower level of the organization. The organization Correct. is not deciding, he is not taking the call. Correct. Uh, and I think, uh, so So that's, that's one uh, definitely the aspect. And that's why you would see uh, that if there are uh, uh, different frameworks like SAFE that are coming up, where it says that you need to have alignment at all three levels. You need to have alignment of portfolio level with program level with team level. And if that does not happen, you are bound to get into problems like this. Uh, so we had a lot of debate on this model. So should we have the same team? So what we tried out is we tried both the models. In model one, what we said is the whole, the same team is taking care of uh, your regular features as well as your production support tickets if they come in. And we said 80% of your capacity is something will count for uh, the, the development of activities. 20% <coughs> activity uh, would be reserved, 20% capacity would be reserved for production support or defect fixing. That was model one. Model two is we separated out those two teams. We had actually team one, which is working only on new features and another team which is working only on production support. Have you seen any of these scenarios? Do you, do you have any thoughts what would have happened in scenario one? It would not work. Yeah. Okay. If what what do you one, if, if, if this company decides to work on uh, the defects which are coming out, it is always a crisis. So they will be loaded with the PFK, P1 team. Correct. If you go with the P1 work, the team which is developed is not there to fix the work. So the technical competency will not be there. Correct. And they are urgent versus important. Exactly. And yeah. Yeah. These, these are production one defects, right? So they have to go out on production immediately as a hot fix, patch, whatever. So in that case, it doesn't really matter what your sprint plan was and whatever you had planned and committed and things like that. But at the same time, when we tried approach two, we had problems there as well. Any any thoughts? Any guess? Any guesses? Putting those changes to the roadmap or the best product line is merging that. Yeah, that, that's one. How do you handle your branching? How do you handle merging and all that? But we had, correct. And we had another thing. This team came to me and said, Rahul, why are we all the, always the deprived ones? You know, Why should we all always do the defect fixing? Why should I be the guy fixing someone else's code? Because you are just dumping uh, production support defects, which is always a crisis mode to me, and I have to really get onto it. 
the model that worked finally is we had this particular scenario, but actually this disaster, I mean, we rotated the teams. So basically, uh, in this release, we had actually three uh, feature development teams, one production support team. In next release, uh, one of the feature development team becomes production support, and the other team comes here. So everyone knows that you know their tech turn is going to be there uh, for production support as well as uh, feature development. So that kind of model finally worked for us, but we did try both the models uh, with the pros and cons. What is the duration of uh, we didn't do it for sprint for sure. We did it for entire release. So our release actually was one quarter. So after one quarter, when we went on to next release cycle, uh, we rotated. So that quarter you Correct. So that cycle worked because then everyone knew that okay, you know, I I need to do uh, both the things. It's going to be my turn as well as it's not the case that those guys are always <coughs> getting benefit and I'm the right one. So that kind of model finally worked well for us. Uh, so this is the model that we did. Actually, we had uh, one quarter release. We had three uh, development sprints and one hardening sprint. And then we would go out of production. We would call it as release candidate one. Now with safe model, this is called as program increment one and program increment two. Uh, so this is what we followed and this works for us. Uh, we had one more, another model that we tried. Uh, and then we had a huge uh, QA team. And of course, pre agile era. We had a development team and a QA team. They all were functionally completely separated. So when we started uh, this Agile model, we had two models. You know, how do we get uh, QA team aligned with the uh, dev team? So what we did, and that worked for us, we had a sprint tester, which means for all the dev team members, there will be some sprint testers. They're actually sitting with the team. They're completely part and parcel of the team. They're working on functional pieces of the team. As well as we have system testers. So those system testers are working on performance testing, they're working on UI automation, they're working on integrated testing. And that model kind of worked for us because otherwise what we were observing is if the sprint testers are supposed to do everything, uh, then the automation gets silent. And the performance testing would never get priority unless it becomes a big problem in your uh, final release, I mean, final your regression testing phase. So this model kind of worked well for us. And we had a balance between the team members, and uh, we could arrive out of that. When you say sprint tester, are you trying to say to arrive the team in the sprint? Correct. So those those team members who are sprint testers, they will be part and parcel of the team. So they are working very closely with dev team members, and they are actually aligning. Uh, they are taking the functional pieces, every build they are testing, and all that. They are from the QA team. They are from the QA team, but they are part of the team. And system testers is basically a team, which is additional team working on some of the system level activities. So those system testers may not be concentrating on that sprint? Correct. So they were not. The correct, correct. So they were actually looking at the system level integration things and performance mm -hmm. testing and all. You have customized the process as well. You have the same question when you were starting when you were. Correct, correct. So you were releasing for testing, like you did the feasible Yes. it was up? No. That so basically, up. so sprint testers are very well part and parcel of the team. So as soon as new features, even even just the UI is great, and there is nothing in the back end, it doesn't dip, uh, put everything in the database. Even if the UI is there, the person has checked in the code, it is available in continuous integration environment. The system, uh, the sprint tester will pick it up and start testing it. Give the feedback immediately. System tester will not start UI automation for that because it's not ready yet. So that kind of model works well. Uh, we also actually, uh, the system team members also had people dedicating our uh, automation framework. So that actually model worked for us. Scrum of Scrum for multi-location environment worked again. We also had a travel budget and this was a product based environment. So we didn't have to convince our US team that, you know, let's reserve some budget for team members to travel. And every quarter we would have two team members traveling to US, participating in different activities. And it was purely knowledge uh, transition and interaction and retention perspective. You know, there was no uh, nothing else attached to it. Rather, we were so open, we told them that in the Indian environment, people like on-site, you know. So we need to have that uh, club well with each other. And that, again, worked well. Uh, with this whole thing, our release time frame changed from one and a half years to three months. Earlier, we were doing a big bang one and a half year cycle. And for customers, it was a big thing. We, with this model, we could get it into three months. That really, really worked well. What actually worked is when we started this, after the first release candidate this happened, we actually put it on a uh, semi-production uh, environment, UAT environment. 
and we had a demo to our customers. The customers looked at it and they screamed about the UI. You know, they literally screamed about the UI. They said, UI is pathetic. You know, this is not the kind of user experience we want. Look at the other guys, there is so much thing happening about rich user interface, HTML5 and this and that. And how can you guys have such a down, uh, you know, old style looking UI? That was a big revelation. And I, I, all the credit goes to Ajay where we had a shorter cycles and we showed it to him. If we would have showed that crappy UI after one and a half years, you know, we, we were gone. So, uh, as you can imagine, this whole next release candidate was completely focused on user experience. We actually entirely revamped our UI uh, using HTML5, we had uh, ESDJS and a lot of different things and then whole UI looking nicer UI and all that. You know? So, that, that again reflected when we uh, presented a demo. But that really worked well because we could get a feedback and we could really know that you know the customers are looking at a lot of other better UIs and this is something that they are not definitely expecting from us. Uh, I had another project uh, which was actually again a product development environment. Again we had multiple product lines, uh, multiple product owners. Uh, in this case all, all the three product lines were following the child. It was the same organization, talk, I mean it was a different organization but same uh, organization having three product lines, all of them following the child. Uh, but interestingly those three product lines had three product owners and all the three product lines as you can imagine were on different technologies. We used a lot of tools because we needed a lot of collaboration between team members and all that. So we had Village as a tool for collaboration and we had Urban City and Urban Deploy. Uh, for deployment, continuous integration. So basically this is something again evolved when we matured, wherein we click a button and then it goes from QA environment to uh, UIT environment. We click a button on the UI, it goes from UIT to production. So it was all seamless. You know, so that, that whole thing we could achieve with urban deploy kind of continuous integration tools. Now, sorry for yeah. interrupting. Now that we are starting with project two, I am just curious that once we are winding up with project one, so you said that one VP started with Agile and only one product line was uh, doing it. Correct. So after looking at the results, like you could uh, show to the customer, did the other product lines got uh, you know motivated to move to Agile? Oh yes, Agile? yes, oh, they did. I mean, uh, then eventually we had all the three product lines uh, moving Agile. We still, uh, I'm not part of that organization now, but uh, we still have a problem of synchronizing between the product lines because, as you can imagine, there are three Agile release trains. You know, and there is a model, there is a theoretical answers available, like safe says you will have agile release train 1, agile release train 2 and agile release train 3 and you can co have coordination between three. But it's not that easy. You know, because the sprint model, the release cycle model for product line 1 and 2 and 3 are obviously different because they support different customers. They have different market pressures. So that problem still exists but all of them are on agile. Uh, so for this product actually we had uh, a lot of conflicting uh, priorities because this was actually a startup organization and even though it was a product dev startup. So we had product one, uh, so we had product backlogs for product one, product two, product three. We had a backlog of user experience enhancements. So we had a UX architect and he had created a UX backlog. Okay, And of course we had uh, some technical debt or uh, defects that we are piling up or that we are carried forward. So how do we prioritize between them? So that was a big problem for us. And we tried actually two different models. Uh, we had a, we actually talked about having a separate product backlog, separate teams, and having a common backlog. So the model one was all three having their separate product backlog and separate team members allocated to those three teams. Uh, the UX features would again be splitted into these three features and the defects again would be part and parcel of individual teams. But what started happening is, this being a uh, startup product environment, uh, what would happen is for the next release of product one, we have some uh, features for which customer is paying. Okay, so that is really, really important features, a lot of focus goes there. So then they said, oh you know, what that means is actually people from these product lines need to contribute here. Because we cannot recruit uh, additional people just for one release of the product. No, so we have to have same team members contributing there. Now if they are gone there or they are basically working on both uh, the teams together, then you are screwed up. Because then you have a lot of conflicts and you have a lot of issues and a lot of challenges. So uh, we also talked, then we actually completely took a radical approach of having a common product backlog. 
So we said everything goes in one single instance, in one single product pattern. So we listed down features of product one, product two, product three, UX, UI design features, as well as defects. Uh, everything was put together in one single common backlog. We had a same team, okay, which is basically of all the three modules, otherwise they would have been split. They, they were a common team available. All the three product owners, plus the UX architect and the technical architect, they all sit together in a, a sprint planning meeting, a release planning meeting. And you can imagine that was a most peaceful meeting that we could have ever had. You know, with all the three product uh, managers and technical architects fighting for their own features, trying to get prioritization or resources allocated uh, for them. Uh, and then basically, uh, but the good thing was we had uh, that meeting could actually identify what is, what is more valuable to the business. You know, in some cases, if the customers are paid for it, and that particular feature is going to get us immediate revenue that was of course on the priority one. But we also had scenarios because of which, because this is let's say on my product backlog, this is feature one. Feature two could be UX thing, and in priority could be a UX feature. Priority three could be a defect. Priority four, four could be this product's feature, and things like that. So we had a mix and match of that. But that mo model somehow worked for us, because we had all of them aligned. They were part of the same organization. They were all uh, cohesive enough where they actually could agree that, okay, this is going to be our common backlog and this is the team, this is the total team contributing to that. So that is the kind of model we uh, uh, finally had. But we had a lot of iterations before we could arrive at this model. Uh, we also tried to follow some of the best practices which are not new to anyone, like Sprint Zero, and this was my actual outcome of Sprint Zero. We had some of the things done. Like, okay, at least the work breakdown structure was in place, uh, like the task split up, I mean. Uh, then design architecture, a lot of things were in progress. Uh, but actually, we had a lot of challenges, that the resources were not available full time. You know, we were already in sprint zero, and end of sprint zero, but the resources were not fully available, because they were still working on previous release of the product, which was going on production, and there were some production support issues, which were more priority than new features coming up. So team members are not fully available. Even right now, I'm actually uh, working on an engagement where the features are not, uh, the people are not 100% allocated. You know, they are 50% allocated on uh, this particular product and 50% on something else. And that always creates chaos. That always creates problems. To add to that, you can have two separate project managers handling two separate product lines, controlling the same team members. You know, that adds even more fun to it. Then you have even more difficult uh, prioritization things to do. And uh, that is what we had for that. Uh, we did work with that. We had a lot of problems, actually. Uh, we had our uh, director of engineering from US. Yeah. Yeah, actually, what I mean by that is the task splitter. We were calling it as WBS at that time. But what we really mean is stories are broken down into tasks. That's what we really mean. Um, so one of the questions that our, uh, our director of engineering asked, and again he went to some <coughs> conference, attended some training, and he asked the question, guys, do we need testers at all? We were taken aback. What do you mean by that? He said, you know, I, I heard uh, in this training that, you know, all the developers are supposed to be testers. You know, and all the testers are supposed to be developers. So there is nothing like dev team and QA team. You know, we just have one single team. So we don't need separate team. He also said, you know, I heard that Facebook doesn't have any testers. There was also an argument that we are doing uh, unit testing and then behavior driven development, acceptance test driven development, test driven development, and so much automation and all of that. Why do you need manual testers? Or why do you need testers at all? You know, if your developers can write all these unit tests and automation tests and everything, why do you need testing team at all? That was a big, big uh, surprise to all of us. And uh, that was actually a challenge. I mean, of course, uh, and there was a question asked about, uh, do you know, why do I need to maintain this 1 is to 4 ratio and all that? But we still uh, realized that we cannot reduce or get rid of QAD. We would still need QAD. Uh, but this was one of the questions that definitely came up. And I still keep hearing this uh, from multiple different environments. That why do we need such a big QA team? Why can't, or at least why can't have the developers doing more and more testing? You know, we don't just want to have that uh, separate big team. Uh, one of the things we did in that work for us is per module, actually we had an organization-wide mandate 
that we need to have actually auto deploy environment, continuous integration, continuous deployment, and so So we define targets. We said for product line one, uh, is auto deployment done? Yeah, auto deployment is already in place. You know, uh, what is the case for auto automation of sanity tests, automation of staging deployment, production deployment? In some cases, it was not required. Some of the cases, production uh, guy says auto deployment and production is a risky thing. We cannot have one click button and deploying on our production and screwing up a production, we cannot do that. We, we had these scenarios, we had a plan uh, which kind of helped for us. We could build uh, that over a period of time. Uh, the next project, which was which was pretty interesting learning from the whole agile environment, it was completely a startup in environment. The customer had a new product idea, so they came to us and they said, can you guys be my technology partner and build this product for me? Uh, and it was, we had a lot of dynamic features, we had a lot of budget constraints. Uh, the customer of course said, I don't want to have a lot of uh, licensed products, you know, I, I don't want to have web logic or things like that, but I have to heavily invest into licenses. Whatever is open source is fine, you know, I'm anyway doing bootstrapping, I'm putting my own money, I don't want to have a lot of investment or licenses to do things like that. And of course, lean processes. Um, so actually, we asked our customer, okay, so what is a product backlog? He said, product backlog? What is that? You know, he had a very simple requirement. I want to build a social networking platform for senior citizens. That's the product I want to build, and you guys are my technology partner. And he said, I don't know what is product backlog. I don't know what is uh, who is product owner and this and that. You know, I said, I have told you my requirement, which is this this one line. You go, you go ahead and build it. You know. And I'm sh you, those of you who are working with startup clients, uh, you can see a lot of things evolve. You know, they just have some product ideas, and it actually starts with there and keeps evolving. Yeah. And then of course the customer said, I cannot have a business owner or a product owner or all of that investment, and I don't, I don't have that much money. I cannot uh, have these separate guys and all of that. And they said, Oh, you know, you are asking for a new feature. He said, What? You know, come on, guys, we are agile. And that's something I hear more and more, you know, where customers actually like this word agile. Come on, we are agile, you know, changes are supposed to happen. Didn't you read the agile manifesto? Didn't you read the principles? You know, you guys are supposed to be taking changes. And it was it was taken royally to that extent. Uh, of course, the customer being startup, we had time to market pressure, continuous change in plans, and to make it even more interesting, uh, we had fixed budget and fixed timeline as well. You know, it's a bootstrapping. Customer said, it has to go live in this quarter, you know, I, I don't have more money. Uh, of course, I get to change the requirements. Is it, it is agile, isn't it? So, but but this is the money and this is the timelines. So now go and enjoy. We started with that. He of course said, we told him this technology stack. You know, so, you know we need to have tools, we need to effectively apply agile, we need to have tools for test case management, for defect management, for automation, performance testing, load testing, DevOps. He said, okay, I mean, use whatever tools you want to use, but don't ask me for any money for that. Don't ask me for any licenses or anything like that. I cannot pay for that. So then, of course, what we had to do is go with this layer, which is completely open source layer. So for all of these layers, we actually identified the tools which are open source tools and make it work with that. Um, and that still happens, I mean, now many customers are actually asking for open source tools. They really uh, don't want to invest heavily in, onto, you know, tools and licenses and get stuck with that. So that's what we had to build uh, for them. And it actually became very stressful. You know, a lot of my team members came back and said, Rahul, this Agile has made things stressful for us. I said, what, what do you mean by that? said, you know, customer is extremely adamant on having these features completed in sprint one. You have to finish it. I have a production deadline, you know. It has to go live on this day. So, and then team members are there on the weekend. They are spending all their night outs and all of that. And they were all blaming uh, Agile for that. You know, you guys are saying Agile and you're saying sprint commitments have to be respected and all that. So now you, you have committed and go and deliver it. That really became a problem. QA team members really asked me this question. Why? So why does Agile request for change in requirements? <coughs> because we were about to get into a regression testing cycle, and as you can imagine, the customer came with change request or changes. You know, there's no change request, 
And then we had to incorporate that, which means change in design and architecture, which means QA team. It was a completely shattered. You know? Yeah. That's why I don't understand. What kind of Okay. So this this specific in this specific case, um, actually, I would I would I have that. Uh, I okay. I in this specific case, we actually burnt our fingers. That is what uh, the point was. In this particular case, uh, the contract was pretty open-ended, and this was kind of our uh, experiment with uh, a startup customers. What happened is the contract said that okay, these are the broad level of features that we will do. It is a time and material with a uh, with a cap. Yeah. So it, you can say, but see, I mean, we we thought that okay, this is a pretty standard model. We have a time and material engagement with a cap on the budget. Like okay, this is will be 100k project. Now what that means is by by definition of time and material, if it gets extended, you have to pay more money. But it didn't happen because the customer said, oh, you know, didn't I told you my cap? And that's what my budget is. I'm bootstrapping. I'm putting my own money. You know, so don't expect more money from me. And what really happened is continuously changing scope really was a problem. And agile was a great excuse for changes. Now customer said, guys, we're agile, and these are changes you have to do. know what is agile and these are also nothing. Correct. Correct. It is a case of complete case of one person who is dealing with the with the customer. That person is overcommitted beyond, and the child has been really. <laughs> <laughs> See, there, there was right. So actually, even overcommitted is a is an understatement because there was no scope. You know, what would you overcommit to? So it, it's, it's it's obvious that you're when you're talking about a child, you have to tell about a child. You have to tell. You cannot go ahead with the cap. So it's okay. obvious. Then. Yeah, but but see, I mean, even if you go and see in different services environments, uh, this model is a pretty common model. You have time and material with a cap. You know, uh, otherwise you would have a fixed price engagement. In many cases, our customers tell us that okay, we'll go with the TNN. These are the resource rates and all that. But whenever that is there, then you need to have a statement of work you need to be exactly. That's this is the scope. Precisely. Do do. Yeah. So that's that's the point I was trying to make at because here actually what happened is we literally burnt our fingers and we actually went to the customer and said. Um, sorry, we cannot support this project. We are shutting it down. So we actually served the notice period from our side and closed the contract because it wasn't working with us. You know, we we ran out of uh, funds from client client side. We actually kept on investing our resources for two more months, but it wasn't possible beyond that. And we we realized that we actually goofed up in our contract as well as uh, engagement at the way we delivered. But that's something I'm sharing because you know, if you are into any of your projects which are of this nature, you know. And this is something happens in a lot of services environments. Customers are very smart. They know what of different models mean. They're, they're of course trying to safeguard themselves from contracting purpose as well as the scope purpose as well as the timelines. And they also know how to pressurize you. You know, they they know that if they put the escalation button, then that's it. Then then you are actually you don't want to lose that client, and for whatever reason you might end up doing that. So that was a big uh, learning for us. And having the not having the product backlog and agreement of scope and not having that period is spread out in contract was a big mistake and that was a disaster for us. We actually uh, resulted into losses and finally stopped this project. Uh, the next project was interesting one because the client was a storage client and again, like I said, uh, initially uh, the client was actually screaming uh, uh, to our organization. So these guys are actually uh, there is always delays and they are not delivering what I expect and all sort of complaints were there. So our management team said, Rahul, can you come here and manage this project? And after two months, uh, their VP sent email to my VP that you know this is going amazing, this is going great and all that. So my VP called me and said, Rahul, uh, what did change? You know, how come suddenly now the client is happy? He said, we didn't change anything. We just started basically following some basic cycles. You know, we have cycles because everyone thought that Agile is not possible in this environment. But when we analyze the project, we realize that we are doing some API development, UI development, feature development, which can go in, in incremental form. So that kind of thing uh, really worked well. Uh, some of the problems we faced in this project is QA team members came and said, oh, you know, who should I report to? Now, because the QA team member had a QA manager, uh, which was from the conventional cycle. He had project manager and he had a scrum master. Now, who should he report to? Who's going to do his appraisals? You know, who's going to decide what to do? 
we had a scenario where a QI team member got an intermediate query and he had a big list of features or big list of feedback. Mm -hmm. Then he said, I'm going to log defects for this. Now the developer screamed at it. He said, no, the, the story is not complete. It's not ready for QA yet. This is just an interim query. So then do we log defects in this case or not? Or how do we share feedback? How do we track it? So we had a lot of debates. But then who takes a call on this? Is it Scrum Master, Project Manager, or Pure Manager? And you will get into these scenarios in your projects as well. There will be a lot of organizational hierarchies and things like that. Uh, and then we had to actually define standards to deal with uh, such scenarios. So then eventually, actually, we realized that it can work for hardware projects or embedded projects or storage networking projects as well. You know, where shorter delivery cycles did help. And the customer actually was very happy because he had a pre-production environment ready, which he could show to his customers to his uh, other downstream dependencies and he was extremely happy about it. That really did well. Uh, and then we had another project uh, which actually had uh, multi-vendor, multi-location environment. So client sits in US and UK and the QA team of automation is with us. Manual testing team uh, sits in Switzerland and development team sits in Russia. So you can imagine what kind of fun we would have had. So, Again, multi-location, multi-vendor team is not a uh, rare scenario. We deal with a lot of these things. We had a dictating manager, so of course, he, was, he again heard this term. Velocity needs to double every sprint. Now, guys, what is happening? You know, how come our velocity is same for the last three sprints? It needs to go up. It needs to double. So that was a problem. This is another problem that I see more and more. The customer said, yeah, actually, the next one, uh, the customer said, you know, I want a QA team member. He said, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of QA folks. He said, yeah, I need, a, he needs to know automation as well. He said, yeah, I mean, we have a lot of automation people. He said, yeah, actually, you know, I'm, he needs to do manual testing. He needs to have automation knowledge. He needs to be a C-sharp developer. He needs to have chef and puppet knowledge. So basically, we need to have configuration management. He should be extremely good in Linux and he should know database. That's it, you know, I don't have a lot of expectations. <laughs> so I call these a superman job descriptions and I hear a lot of these post agile environment, you know. The customers are saying, guys give me one guy but he should know all of these and then I'll handle, uh, then I'll get my work done with that. That's another challenge we see. This is another question that customers nowadays ask, why should I pay for manual testing? If my whole regression was taking 5 days, automation runs it in 4 hours. So it's a 90% effort reduction, why should I pay for manual testing at all? And all, all the manual testers are really under a big threat because of that. You know, the customers are really, really asking for people with uh, Superman GD. On the other contrary, we had uh, problems inside. So all the QA team members came and said, oh, you know, I do, I'm not an automation developer. I'm not a developer at all. I don't have programming background. I don't know. And then they also said, are you converting QA to developers? And after this training, actually, they came and said, Rahul, I have been doing now this coding for over six months now. Now you better make me developer and give me higher salary, otherwise I'm quitting. Because now I have enough job offers in the market because I know automation, I know coding. You know, I, I can go as a developer as well. On the contrary, developers were complaining that you're converting me to QA. You're asking me to write test cases, automation? Come on, you know, I'm not a QA guy. I'm a sacred, actually I'm a developer, you know. You're converting my religion. That was a big debate we had. And then QA team members said, okay, now I'm convinced about agility and I'm convinced about automation. But what should I learn? You know, there are so many things out there in the market. Automation testing, performance testing, load testing, usability testing, come on. I mean, there's no end to it. I mean, it's just going on and on and on. And there has been a big uh, problem. So manual testing is not alone. You know, manual testers are not alone. We are getting a lot of questions nowadays. What is the role of a QA manager? If Scrum Master is running the show, why should I actually pay for a QA manager? In fact, the manager's billing is reducing significantly post agile environment. And that's a big challenge for all of us uh, in services environments for sure. Uh, and then who, who does uh, reporting and all that? Because whether you talk about Scrum model, there's no manager. You talk about sales, there's no more manager. So what happens to that? You know, that has been a big uh, challenge to us. Yeah, so there's a big laundry list to this. Uh, so how do you handle agile in this environment, that environment, and all of that, and it just keeps going on and on and on. I just wanted to say that it's not all that bad. A few things did work as well, and I just quickly mentioned that. What we did is we created a, a layer 
that between our teams and between our management team, we would have few people working as coordinators. Quality masters, scrum masters, test masters, and tech masters. And that coordination actually worked, because then we could have a community of practice on these areas, and that really worked well. We also had agility assessment. We actually, the team members together, uh, identify where we stand, and what are the gap areas, what are the areas where we are doing uh, pretty weak, and those could be the areas of improvement. We also did best team implementation award. So we actually reviewed the teams on different parameters, and this was actual dashboard. And the best team was given a grand you know, team party or best award or something like that. Uh, we also did a lot of agile onboarding things, where we created a lot of training plans, templates. We conducted a lot of quizzes and agile, uh, basically quizzes. And uh, we used a lot of in-house and external training material, white papers, conferences, videos. And that helped us building a lot of environment. We created our own processes, tailored them, went through multiple iterations, and adapted them. So that was good. And uh, the retros have been very helpful. We also used tools which actually started giving us predictions, where if you put everything in Jira, it will show us that, oh, you know, you are seeing release date of first time, but it's actually slipping to fifth time. Because this was going extrapolation and giving us a lot of insights, which was pretty helpful. And the thing that also worked was uh, innovation games. So we uh, did a lot of innovation games. So this was uh, my team actually doing the retrospection meeting. And a lot of these collaborative environments did work well. So at the end, I would like to say that it has been fun. We've seen a lot of issues, challenges, problems in applying design. But if you apply it right, of course, uh, you can get a great outcome out of it. Thank you. I hope uh, this added some value. Thank you. No, it was not a manager, it was a coordinator. So okay. core team will have these They were working as a coordinator, but of course, like earlier they were managers. No, that wasn't the case. Basically what we wanted to make sure is, per team, there is someone who is actually focusing on quality aspect. Per team, there is someone who is a scrum master. There is a test master and tech master. So someone who is making sure technical aspects are getting worked out properly. So coding standards, code reviews are happening. So that is that coordinator. It's not a manager. Okay. He's just a coordinator. Okay. Um, but he's acting as a coordinator. He's a coordinator. Like, uh, maybe, like, I say that you are today a coordinator. I am scrum coordinator. He is test coordinator. He is maybe tech, tech coordinator. But may, we all four may not agree on one, one, one or other thing. Yeah, so what we had is actually for all these four layers, we had four coordinators here as well. Like, basically, for all, we had a total eight teams. So all eight teams, technical uh, tech masters actually, used to have their meeting, their scrum of scrum. Mm -hmm. They were discussing technical best practices, technical tools, standards, and things like that. So that kind of model we followed in that model. Mm -hmm. We did actually, we created one VM template. So in one virtual machine template, we had all of these tools installed. And this was actually become a VM template. So any new project would come up, we would just create an instance out of the VM template and would give it to that project. So that on day one, you have everything configured, and uh, you can start using it. So that model worked well, where we had a VM template. So you don't have to invest on anything. You just spin off a VM out of a template, and your whole stack is there. Uh, well, it is dependent. See, services industries, I wouldn't say we are agile. We recommend all our customers to be agile, but it is also the customer, he should be ready for that. You know? His own environment should be ready for that. We have seen a lot of customers say that they want agile, but this is uh, connects to the failure mode that I have seen, where they, they themselves need to be clear on what agile modality means. Correct. Yeah, so we are, we basically, uh, before kickoff of a project, we define our project's working modalities or working mechanism, and that is what we follow. Uh, we have been, I, I mean, I have been involved into multiple, persistent believes in agile as, as an organization-wide methodology. Not only just agile, persistent has decided that safe is the model that we we'll follow, and we'll not have confusion of different models and things like that. So that's something we have started for two years now. Yeah, so 
Yeah, so right. So actually, first of all, you know, we did, yeah, we really scope has to be there. I mean, see, if you are talking about a fixed price project, which is actually it was, because we thought it's a TNM, and since it's in the in the a sort of view, it is mentioned TNM. That wasn't the case. Actually, it was a fixed price project, so we should have defined the scope in that case. Because we need to safeguard ourselves as well. You, know, you cannot be doing a fixed price and agile and then uh, changing the scope in the same way. Quick, quick question. Then we take the questions okay. offline. Last question. Suppose, like, uh, did you try to convince the customer when he issued the agile process? Like, customer said, it's a, we are agile. Right. <coughs> the customer. Yeah, we are agile. Right. Right. What is the agile? No, what is the agile? 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 He did, he did. See, see, it was a, it was a product. Customer quite a. Exactly, exactly. Exactly. Changing, changing one question. Exactly. 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 Exactly.